Welcome to Liberty Revealed, the only show where you will learn about all things liberty. Your host for the show is a registered libertarian who's been involved in politics for more than 25 years. He has a passion for teaching others about the concept of personal liberty. Please welcome your host, Mike Mahoney. I am a big believer in personal liberty. To me, my rights end where your rights begin. What this means is law should ensure that your freedom to live your life as you choose does not impact everyone else's freedom to live their lives as they choose. This is personal liberty. If you want to learn more about personal liberty and get more from this show, sign up to receive my 10-page guide on personal liberty entitled Liberty Revealed. You need to fill out a simple form located at yogispodcastnetwork.com forward slash liberty revealed. That's Y-O-G-I-S podcastnetwork.com forward slash Liberty Revealed. Once you read through that ebook, you are guaranteed to be in a position to apply the philosophy of personal liberty. Hey everybody, uh, we're back with another episode of Liberty Revealed. And today I have a special guest. Um, today's guest is Ocean View School District Trustee Gina Clayton Tarvin. Um, as a veteran teacher in LA County and a career long leader in her teachers union, AFT Local 2317, Gina has served as an executive board member in multiple positions. She's currently serving as a union state representative. She negotiated a $26 million agreement with Republic Services to cover a controversial trash facility in the Oakview neighborhood, helping to bring environmental justice to the community. Um, she's currently Assembly District Delegate appointed by California 48 uh, Congressman, newly elected Congressman, Harley Rhoda, to the Democratic uh, State Central Committee. So welcome to the show, Gina. Thank you. So glad to be here. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for taking the time today. So so I think what everybody's curious about is what what got you interested in politics and running for office? Well, that's kind of like a, a story we'd have to go back to the 70s uh, for. So just... You know, the thing is, is both my parents were really um, political and my dad was appointed to the State Board of Equalization back in the day by an Ernie Dronenberg. Have you ever heard that name? He's like an old school conservative from San Diego. Anyway, my dad had run for office as well um, in San Diego and his first Uh, run was when I was two years old and he ran for county supervisor and he just barely lost, but he really wanted that job because his cousin was the supervisor of San Bernardino County and it was kind of in the family. Anyway, um, he sort of uh, moved past that. And my mom actually then became the more political of the two. She was the president of the San Diego County Republican Women's Federated for over a decade. And I got really involved in politics through the Republican Party, actually. So I was um, born and raised a Republican, even though I'm a Democrat now. I mean, it's kind of like religion. You're born into your religious uh, affiliation and you're born into your political party. But I really cut my teeth on politics, you know, through the Republican Party. And the first campaign I ever worked on, besides my parents, of course, um, was uh, for Big George Bush. I call him Big George Bush. Um, And when he ran against Dukakis, who I just found so just awful, I said, you know what, I've got to work. For, for George Bush. And I was really excited about it at the time. Anyway, fast forward after I get out of college, um, I'm then a teacher and I'm working for the teachers union. I became the union steward or the site rep at my school site after one year of being a teacher. Um, and then I became the uh, secretary of the union the next year and then the vice president. And I went into, you know, over a decade of union work on the executive board. And that really taught me a lot about politics. So I guess it's I started teaching at 25 in Hawaiian Gardens, which is southeast L.A. County. And then I uh, was approached at the time I was living in Long Beach, actually. And I was approached by some people in Long Beach in District 4. And District 4 is like Naples, Belmont Shores, that kind of area. It's actually pretty conservative. Um, I had switched to being a Democrat just slightly before that. And I'll get to those reasons in a minute. But. I was asked to run for the school board in Long Beach Unified, which is huge. Like the districts are enormous. So just to mail to Democrats in that district, it was like 80,000 voters. 
unbelievable. So I did, I took the chance. I ran against actually an incumbent. He had been the superintendent of the school district and he had been on the board for many years. He was sort of like a legend in Long Beach Unified, the principal of Wilson High School and all of that. And I almost beat this guy. I lost by 200 votes, literally. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was like, oh my gosh. So I really got the taste, you know, for for politics and for, um, you know, wanting to get involved in a local level. And I thought, I'm a teacher. I should be on a school board. So then again, fast forward, I end up, um, you know, continue working in ABC Unified. I um, moved to Huntington or back to Huntington Beach, I should say. And I went to a school board meeting in 2012. Uh, because I was asked by my son's first grade teacher when I went to his parent conference, teacher parent conference, I show up at the parent conference and she says, um, Ms. Clayton Tarvin, you're a, you're a union leader, right? And you're a district? I said, yes, I am. She said, well, we really need help in Ocean View School District. We're having a really hard time. Our board is really awful. We have these awful people on the board. The whole board is Republican. Well, wait, four of them are Republicans and one's a libertarian, actually. OK, yeah. and that libertarian is Norm Westwell. Well, he's since left the Libertarian Party and he's now with the Republican Party because he wanted their endorsement. So he wasn't. Um, let's just say he's not real. Um, well, I'll get back to him later. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of the latest kind of yeah. mess he's been making for us. OK, so I go to the microphone and I get on the microphone and I'm talking about what the teacher asked me to talk about, which was. They were going to raise class sizes from 20 to 1. Do you remember that initiative in California? Yes. Okay, so yes. 20 to 1, which was a great initiative, K3. And it was, you know, keeping class sizes low with the little kids. You need to teach them to, you know, read and write, do math, all of that. This board in one vote went from 20 to 1 to 29 to 1, which is just outrageous. Because what you're doing is you're essentially putting a whole third of another class in there you know, half of a class actually when you're at 20 to one and you're putting this upon teachers that are really having a hard time getting kids to just be literate, you know, just to be able to sound out words and things like that. So I went to the microphone and I was the only parent there. There were a lot of teachers and a lot of staff, but I, I came to the mic and I said, you know what? I said, let me explain something to you. I said, 29 is an awful number. It's an awful number because, well, it's an odd number. You can't make groups, collective learning groups out of it. It's even worse because it's a prime number. I said, I'm a teacher. These things pop into my head. 29 is a prime number. You can never, it's not divisible by anything. So how are you going to make groups for students to learn? What are you going to do with this last child? And I said, this is just outrageous. You're, you're taking a good system that we have here in Ocean View. And to save a few bucks, you're going to put in more kids. I said, you know what? I said, you watch because when it comes time for November, we, the voters in the Ocean View School District, are going to remember, remember you. We're coming for you at the ballot box. You can guarantee it. And I go away. Yay! Everybody starts clapping. Yay! Oh, wonderful. Yeah. You know, because I was pretty aggressive at the mic. I get home. The next day, I get a call from my neighbor. He's actually Gino Bruno. Have you ever seen Gino Bruno online? I sure have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So Mr. Bruno is my next door neighbor and his daughter happens to be a teacher in the Ocean View School District and is um, involved in the teachers union. So she fa he found me and he said, uh, the teachers union would like to talk to you. And I said, what teachers union? He said, the Ocean View Teachers Association. I said, all right. give OK, fine. So the, the leader of the three different unions in Huntington Beach, which is the HB City District, Huntington Beach Union High School District and Ocean View. There's three big unions and she runs them all. She's the executive director. Her name's Mona Kamora. And she called and she said, hey, um, would you ever consider running for the school board? Because I heard you speak at the meeting the other night and um, I just really want to know. And I said, you're calling me and just like that, you want to know if I'm going to run for the school board? I said, OK, let's talk about this. Number one, do you have money? Do you guys have money? Do you will you run your own independent campaign? Because we can't coordinate. That's against the law. So will you run your own independent campaign? Do you have money? I said, do you have boots on the ground? Do you have people that will go knock on doors? Do you have people that'll precinct walk? I said, and you know, what's your what's your platform like? What do you guys, you know, expect? I said, bottom line, I'm not gonna take any donations from you because I don't want anyone to ever say that I am bought by the teachers union. I am not. I said, I we can be friends. I can sit down and talk to you about what are your needs. I said, but what I'm not going to do is your bidding. I said, so if you're okay with that 
and you'll run me as a one single candidate. I said, don't put me on a slate. And I got that from my dad, by the way. My dad always said, don't ever run on a slate. He said, right. I agree. Yeah. So I, you know, they agreed to it all. And I went and I filed my paperwork with like a week to go. And boom, I was in business. And I took out libertarian Norm Westwell. <laughs> I, I, I actually have I actually have met him at a libertarian event. Um, we can talk about that later. It was an interesting, an interesting meeting, actually. Yeah, he's an interesting um, person. We have a lot of a lot of things in parallel, though, because I can tell you, I gosh, I think it was um, yeah, it was 2010, and similar thing. They were they were in Cypress School District. They were going through some major changes, and unfortunately, a lot of the board members had been on the board for 30, 40 years. Oh wow! And really had no idea what was going on at the schools and um they were going through some modernization at the time they they put out a big bond for modernization and i spoke at a board meeting just like you did and someone actually chased me out into the parking lot and practically begged me to run for school for school board i did run i lost by 300 votes oh. and uh, i lost to a guy who promised that he would bring taxes from sacramento back to cyprus and he promised that if he didn't do that, he wouldn't run again. Well, we both know he didn't do it. I mean, I, I don't think I have to tell you that. Yeah, he and he still that. ran again multiple times. Of course um, he did. You know, and people bought into that. But, you know, it is what it is. But it taught me a lot about just politics in general is the same. I don't care if it's school board, city council, um, county supervisor, state, you know, state legislature, um, federal level. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. It's it. It, I like what you said about the, you know, do you have boots on the ground? Because honestly, the ground game is key. Um, I'm actually writing a book right now about how to use social media for oh. campaigning because I think I found when I ran for supervisor that that, you know, I'm trying to get it, I'm trying to reach people in Huntington Beach. I don't live in Huntington Beach, mm -hmm. but there's like 75,000 registered voters in Huntington Beach that I need to reach. The fastest way was get on some of these forums follow their rules, but manage to get your name, like your, your ideas out there. So I'm writing a book about that, but, but you mentioned Gino, I, I find him to be a very interesting, um, a very interesting guy. Um, very well informed. Yes. I have to say, mm -hmm. um, he, he was, he was sort of, uh, he didn't like me very much when I was running for office because my views are opposite of his, but mm. at the same time, I found him to be fair. Like a lot of people, you, that's is how I met you was through um, the one of the Huntington Beach forums when you were being harassed. Yeah. Um, and it seems it seems like anytime you pop up, um, there's a whole group of trolls who come out and they have something to say. What? So now you got elected. Yes. What happened to bring those people out of the woodwork like that? Like why why are why are they um, why why is their opinion so negative? Is what I would ask. Yeah. Um, okay. So I got elected in 2012. And in 2014, we had a, a bit of an issue in the Ocean View School District. You may have heard about it is where an asbestos sort of let out after uh, bond some some work we did with modernization funds, COPS funds. And um, anyway, it wasn't our big bond uh, that we passed in 16. It was prior. Um, anyway, I was not in the board majority at the time. And really the only friend I had on that school board and colleague and ally was trustee John Briscoe, who's a pretty known, um, you know, right leaning uh, you know, OCGOP type of guy. And I'm sort of like on the opposite end of the spectrum. But John and I have created a very interesting uh, partnership or a team. And uh, people have kind of termed it the uh, the John and Gina show or the Gina and John show. Uh, <laughs> Because we political party be damned. We just do what's right for children. And one thing we did do is we blew the whistle on this asbestos situation. And we brought in the media and we brought in, you know, the parents. Uh, we had big giant town halls where people until one in the morning where people were going ballistic. HBPD had to show up in their riot gear. I mean, it got really ugly. But the reality was at the time, the board majority didn't care about children. They didn't care. They didn't care that they were abating asbestos with the kids on campus in the buildings, guys with white spacesuits walking around covered in, in asbestos and stuff. And people are sitting at their desks and stuff is falling from the ceilings. And like, this is OK. So John and I was like, this is not OK. We're blowing the whistle and this is stopping now. 
we ended up shutting down three of our schools, Hope View, Lake View, and Oak View, and busing the kids out to Buena Park, actually, um, to Savannah District and to Centralia District. And we sent some of the littler kids out to Westminster School District. And that sort of started, I mean, it almost created this weird uh, cultish following of me in a positive way. People saw me as this sort of heroin, the hero of this episode. And John, too, he actually was reelected. We flipped two seats on the board. We ended up getting a board majority. Again, all Republicans, I'm the only Democrat, but this majority was really interested in doing what's right for children. Now, we had also at the time had some litigation going. You may have heard about it. It was we were suing the Republic or the Rainbow Transfer Station uh, based in Huntington Beach, now bought by Republic Services, the largest trash hauler in the United States. It's a publicly traded multi-billion dollar corporation. Actually, their largest uh, shareholder is Bill Gates. OK, and, you know, he's supposed to be Mr. Education, care about children. Well, I can tell you in the end, I'm not sure that he really cared what was happening. There is a situation where we have this open air trash dump right next to our most highly affected low income school in all of Huntington Beach. It's called the Oakview Elementary School and Oakview Preschool. And there's even a state preschool in the middle. So with all those three schools there, there's a thousand kids next to an open air, stinking, stench ridden trash dump. So the board sued. We sued the city of Huntington Beach. We sued the county of Orange. We sued the state of California. We sued the trash dump themselves. And in the end, we prevailed on all of those, which led to this $26 million settlement. Now, along the way, I picked up some enemies. The first enemy I picked up, I guess, or a person that was in opposition to me was Chris Epting. Uh, he is a person that was working for the LA Times at the time. He was a 10-year columnist there. And he wanted to do an article about this particular site. And he had sort of approached me about it. And we did an interview. And I didn't want to do the interview. He ended up recording me. I didn't want to be recorded. And we kind of got into a bit of a disagreement. And he was actually let go by the L.A. Times, not just solely because of that episode, but some other things. Anyway, um, that started a whole three year sort of like aggression towards me. Um, he wasn't the only person. And I have to give Chris credit now. Chris and I have sort of um, I don't know if you know this, but we have buried the hatchet. We have mended fences. He came. Oh, good. Yeah, he came to me in July of 2018 and he apologized to me and he said, you know what? This has just got to stop. It's really too negative. It's not good for you. It's not good for me. It's not good for the city. I think that if we can, you know, find common ground and, and get over this, it would be great. And I said, you know, Chris, I will consider it. And I finally, after a couple of months, met with him and sat down with him and we ironed it out and we're actually OK now. And um, we actually allowed him to speak in one of our schools recently in the school that my child goes to. So Chris and I have really come a long way, I have to say. Um, he has. Um, sort of turned over a new leaf. He's doing his own thing in a positive way. Um, but there were some people that were following him that just can't let go of their hate for me because I defended 1,000 Mexican kids, okay? That's what this is really about. It's environmental injustice. It's about racism. It's about bigotry. And I'm not scared to say it. A lot of people want to be politically correct. They don't want to say those terms. I'll say it. It's true. They don't care because those are brown people in Oakview. That's the bottom line. And a lot of them would say stuff like, well, they knew what they were getting in living next to the trash dump. Well, guess what? Gross polluters don't get to gross pollute just because they want to. There are laws in California, nuisance abatement laws that say just because you have a business doesn't mean you can do what you want. People have rights. Human beings have rights to breathe clean air and drink clean water. And that's what the whole crux of my activism was about. You're not going to pollute a thousand kids and you're not going to pollute a hundred teachers and a whole neighborhood full of 10,000 people. That's not right. And I'm not going to stand for it. And you know what I said? If I never get reelected again over this, if I get kicked out of office, so be it. At least I will have done something right by the people. I don't care anymore. So that's how I picked up, I guess, most of my critics was through that that particular episode. See, this is one of the reasons why um, 
I, I remember messaging you at one point, and I know you know you're Democrat, I'm a libertarian, but I think that honestly, I think the party system kills our entire system because pe- there's too many people who they only vote one way because that's their label that they put on themselves. Yeah. And what I liked about what I saw coming from you is things like this, where you know what, if I don't get reelected because I did did the right thing, well, then I don't get reelected because I did the right thing. And that's that's how I felt. Like when I when I ran for for board of supervisors, I met with um, some people who said, well, what what will you do when you first take office? And I said, well, the first thing I do is take her staff of like 15 people and eliminate a bunch of those people. They're not necessary, you know. Um, and and once and then once we save the money, then I can come back to the rest of the board and say, look, I've been operating just as well as you for the last six months and I have half the staff. How about you do the same thing? We can give that money back to the county so the county can do something. You know, you got to do the right thing. You don't, you don't, maybe that would have made it so I would never get reelected. Oh, well, um, you got to do the right thing. And that's one of the things that really drew me to, to you as a person is your willingness to speak your mind, say what, say what was right. And honestly, you're, you're sort of like a, um, we're connected in that way because I do the same thing and mm-hmm. I get a lot of grief for it sometimes. Um, I've, I've had people tell me I'm rude and I always say, oh, I'm rude because I spoke the truth. Okay. I didn't know that that meant I was rude, but all right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see the same thing happening to you. People say, you know, you're rude. You, yeah. you'll say, and what's funny, some of the things they say about you, I think are completely the opposite of who you really are yeah. because, you know, you stand for the truth and yet they make it sound like, you stand for your own agenda. And I don't, I personally don't see that at all, but I wanted to tell my, my um, listeners that like, you know, you mentioned Norm. I mean, I met, I met Norm at a, there's a, a movement going on within the libertarian party here in California where they're, they're learning from mostly from Democrats, to be honest, uh-huh. um, that, that small groups accomplish big things. And so they're starting, like there's a Huntington beach libertarian group uh-huh. that, started and um it's interesting because both um norm came to one of the meetings and then john briscoe did a debate about um immigration at one of the meetings so we're open to any party we don't care um but they're trying to grow well in doing this and i met norm and hmm, he was a little off if you ask me he is not normal (laughs) he's not right and yet the truth he is not he's not right in the mind i believe when he told us that he he decided to run as um, a Republican because there was more money to be had, yeah, um, which I which I found intriguing because I mean, I think when I ran for school board, I spent maybe five thousand dollars total on the whole thing, mm-hmm. um, and did just fine as I said. Um, I, I don't I didn't understand that logic, but tell us a little bit about what you've gone through with with him of late. Yeah, so. Uh, well, bef- before I just want to say one thing about John. I don't know if you know this about John Briscoe, but he's a longtime libertarian as well, and he changed to the Republican Party years ago. And I've learned a lot about um, libertarianism and just kind of like how the party, you know, has been functioning even back like in the '60s from John. You know, he's kind of brought. He's like, this is the history of you know the Libertarian Party, and I was like, that's fascinating. And actually, I think I think what's really interesting about the Libertarian Party and the Democratic Party is that we kind of intersect on certain issues. It's like, don't tell me what I'm going to do with myself. This is my body or this is how I'm going to live. This is what I want to do. And I think a lot of Democrats feel like that. Um, And then and then it's weird because there's intersections between the Republican Party and the Libertarian Party. Um, It's very it's just fascinating. But you're right. I think about with all these labels, how do we get together and work together? And it's really difficult. And one thing that Norm has been almost impossible on is working together. So Norm Westwell is a man who is a a complete obstructionist. Everything we do at the school board meetings, he kind of just is uh, a naysayer. He's like, no, it's not. It's this, it's that. We're all, you're all failures. He calls the staff failures. He calls the children failures. I mean, who does this? Who goes to a school board meeting of a school district that is, you know, um, in charge of preschool to eighth grade. So we're talking three-year-olds to 14. And he calls the kids failures. Hello, you're abnormal. Okay. He calls the staff failures. He says they're awful. They're junk. They're they're doing crappy work. It's like, why would you do that, Mr. Westwell? Why? So 
one of his latest stunts, uh, actually, if you go back to when I was the president the last time, so I served as president for three consecutive terms, which is very unusual in any governance body. But I did it at the time because of, of all of the kind of upset we were going through with Rainbow, with passing the bond, with the asbestos thing. I had, the, I guess, the most institutional knowledge and the board kept voting me back as president. My last term as president, I had these people start coming to our board meeting showing up the Proud Boys. I know you are familiar with the Proud Boys and the all yeah. right, the Rams Rise Against Movement, all these neo-Nazi right-wing groups that are just crazy off the charts. I don't even know where these people come from. These people started coming to our board meetings and threatening me, heckling me, talking about, you know, we're going to take you out. We're going to bomb the meeting. We're going to pipe bomb. I'm going to take this. I mean, I'm going to just say something a little um, unpleasant, but I'm going to tell you what people were saying. I'm going to take this bitch by her hair and pull her down off the dice and beat the shit out of her. That is what people have done, said to me. And the police watch, HBPD watches all of this as it goes down in live feeds. Okay. So they're sending patrol cars. They're sending units because they see that I'm, you know, when I'm trying to run a meeting, I've had to shut meetings because of these disruptive people. And that's where that Chuck Johnson, who I ended up having to get a restraining order comes in. Norm ends up going and uh, testifying on Chuck's behalf in court during the hearing. Can you imagine this? I mean, it was like, Norm, you you really, uh, unbelievable. So Norm at one of the board meetings tells me, you know, he won't be quiet. Okay. The chair of the meeting is supposed to keep the meeting decorum, right? Right. And you're supposed to keep control of the meeting. You only speak when you're spoken to, you have to raise your hand. You have to ask to be recognized. Robert's rules of order are very specific. And as the chair of the meeting, you know, I'm, uh, you know, function as a quasi parliamentarian, even though we have a parliamentarian. And Norm just didn't want to cooperate, telling me, you know, I mean, as ridiculous as this, shut your pie hole. Shut your pie Wow. I mean, then it was, uh, you're acting like a queen. That was his next statement. Then he sends rude emails to the superintendent and I, sexually, like, making sexual innuendos. You need to both get your panties out of the twist, ladies, and things like that. Then we're in closed session about two weeks ago. And I can tell you this now, this is not a violation of California Brown Act, because what he did is not protected under the Brown Act. He literally sexually harassed me and made sexual gestures like advances at me in close session with the superintendent present, the deputy superintendent, the assistant superintendent, and all five board members. Okay, here's what he did. We're having a disagreement about one particular issue, which I can't discuss. But anyway, he says to me across the table, well, if you don't like it, trusty Clayton Tarvin, that's too bad. Ha, 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 baby. And he's doing kisses at me. In a public, wow. in a closed session meeting of a board of trustees, he's blowing kisses at me and calling me inappropriate names. I'm like, excuse me? Did you just sexually harass me in the middle of a meeting? I said, that is actionable. Like, you are ridiculous. And he thought I was just going to keep it there in closed session. I said, superintendent, did you see that? Yes. Did you see it, Tr uh, President Briscoe? Yes. So we get out of closed session. We get back onto the dais. And it's time for me to make my trusty comments. And he thinks I'm not going to say anything about it because he thinks I'm in fear of violating the Brown Act. Wrong. I'm not. Because I didn't violate the Brown Act. And I sat there right during my trustee's comments and I outed him. And he denied it all with eight witnesses in the room. Wow. So John Briscoe, our president, said, you know what? I've had enough of this. This is enough. He is not going to do this to you. You know, I do not appreciate. I don't take uh, well this, um, you know, sexual harassment, harassment of women, you and Dr. Carol Hansen. He said, this is enough. I'm done. And John wrote the censure himself. The staff didn't do it. John Good for him. wrote it. He wrote it. He agendized it. Um, and we had debate. Uh, Norm Westwell tried to stymie the debate. He tried every possible tactic he could under Robert's Rules of Order to stop the, the, the motion from even being heard. But of course, we outvoted him. The motion was heard and we all debated. And every single trustee on the dais said, you did that, Norm. Stop lying. You did it. The superintendent, she said it, the deputy and the assistant, they all sat there in, in front of all the public and said, you did this. So he looked like a, a pathological liar sitting up there, which is what he is. 
Okay. And um, luckily the Los Angeles times uh, was there. The reporter was there and she did an excellent job of, you know, um, memorializing what occurred. And you know what? The public needs to know what this man is up to. It's not okay to do that to anyone. It's not okay. And, and is that the kind of example that he thinks is right to set when we are the stewards, when we are the caretakers of mm. small children? I mean, I'm asking, not. is that, does that not mortify you? If your children were in our school district or any, you know, anywhere, would you want your board members behaving this way? Heck no. That's a big no for me. I mean, you know, you, you brick to mind, you, you mentioned the, the disruptions at the meetings and mm -hmm. um, we, when SB 54, when the cities were running around voting to opt themselves out of SB 54, uh, one of the things my wife and I were doing was going to these meetings. Um, I mean, I, I was actively campaigning for the the seat um, for board of supervisors. And so I'm going to these meetings to see what, what the heck is going on. And literally we went to one in Los Alamitos where ironically, those who were on the left were on the left and those who were on the right were on the right. And they were yelling things at each other across the, the aisle. And you know how you say, like, you don't understand something until you experience it? Well, I've, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, as they say, a privileged white man. Yeah. And I've never really experienced direct racism. I, I've had police officers harass me because I'm white, mm -hmm. but I um, never really experienced it until that day. I mean, I came away from there with a rather heavy heart. And as an example, an Asian man stands up. And he starts talking. And so the people on the right start yelling, you know, go back to where you came from. Only to find out within like a minute of him opening his mouth that he's on their side. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, I didn't go to that meeting that night, but I watched it online and it was awful. I it was terrible. Were there in person. That's, oh, my gosh. It was it was a major slap because I left there, you know, like people try to say, well, the right is racist or the left is racist. And I'll tell you, there's racist on both sides. Oh, yeah. And and it was horrible. I, I had a lady get in my face and start yelling and screaming at me. And my wife finally said, you realize he agrees with you on this point. Right. And she's like, what? He agrees with me. Yeah. You just screamed at him and he agrees with you. And I mean, what this is what's happened in our society. And I, I blame the Trump movement for this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the people love the idea that he says, I actually had someone on the show who said, I asked him, he, he moved from Democrat to Republican and now he's running for office in New York. Mm -hmm. And I asked him what he thought of the lies and he spoke all around the lies. Didn't, didn't address it. But one of the things that he said that sort of, I don't know, irked me a little bit was, well, I like that. He says what's on his mind. Well, to my way of thinking, um, it's one of the problems I had with President Obama in his second term was sometimes he would open his mouth way too soon as the president. Um, as the president, I feel like you need to be neutral, stay back. You, you know, you're going to have your opinion, but keep it to yourself until all the facts are in. And before you convict, you know, anybody, a police officer or a, or a teenager or whatever, don't convict them in the media. And Trump does this. And so then that emboldens other people to also act that way. And we went to we went to four different city council meetings. The exact same group of people would show up and it would be like, you know, at one meeting, I'm John from Los Alamitos. Oh, I'm John from Huntington Beach. I'm John from Fountain Valley. I'm John from Costa Mesa. Hey, John, you live a lot of cities in Orange County. How, how, how'd this happen, John? You know, and I actually confronted that guy and said, how? How are you a resident of four different cities? I'm not a resident of four different cities. That's very interesting, but but very, ra very racial. Yeah. Um, I mean, agree with the sanctuary cities thing. Don't agree with it, mm -hmm. but don't be racist about it. That mm -hmm. that really irritated me to no extent. And but what I'm getting at is, this is what you deal with when you're sitting up on a dais like that. Is you you have to let the public speak, yeah. and they can say pretty much anything they want, yeah. and you're not even allowed to respond to it. No. No. And, and what's really crazy, you know, what's funny is you're talking about these people that were going to the SB 54 meetings, you know, they have a moniker, they have a name, it's called the um, hate circus. They, they're called the hate circus. And the hate circus was led by Gracie Vandermark. We can come back to her later. Um, yeah. You know about her. But the bottom line is she was this hate circus, they were coming to 
the ocean, their main target was the Ocean View School District Board of Trustees meetings. And then they started doing this city hate circus tour. Okay. And what was happening, uh, Johnny Benitez from the Proud Boys and Raymond Herrera from the uh, Minutemen and all these different guys were coming and they're coming to the microphone and they're literally screaming in the microphone, Gina's Clayton Tarvin is a goddamn lying, blah, blah, blah. She's a snake. She's a commie. And I'm like, okay, I'm a commie. I'm a snake. That irrelevant. You can call me anything you want. Hey, and you know what? Hate speech is free speech, by the way. I'll tell you what's not free speech. When you're talking about dragging me off the dais and beating me to a pulp, talking about that you want me to be raped, okay, talking about the fact that you're going to blow me up, talking about the fact that you're going to crooked Gina, be quiet or be killed. How about that one? Okay, these are the things that I ended up taking Chuck Johnson to court for because these are the threats he was making. You can come to the microphone and public comments in the United States of America and practically say whatever you want. But if you come to the microphone and you make threats, it doesn't matter who it is. You cannot do it. Just because I'm a public official or you're a public figure because you ran for office doesn't mean that we have to shoulder the burden of being harassed, harangued, and, and, you know, uh, just constantly stalked. I, I mean, I, for a whole year, was looking over my shoulder everywhere I went. We had to hire armed security at our board meetings. We've had them for a year and a half. We even went to the sheriff to see if they would do it because HBPD was coming for about three months. And our chief of police, Rob Handy, just said, I can't afford it anymore. So we went to the sheriff. Sandra Hutchins at the time. And she said, you know, we'll probably take the contract. Well, we waited a little too long. If you wait with the sheriff, you like drop off their list. Right. Like, Sorry, we we uh, now we're out of officers. So we ended up having to hire like hired guns to come to our meetings. And can you imagine I'm presiding over a school district board meeting of little tiny preschool kids and, you know, kids coming and doing plays and singing songs. And I have guys in the back with loaded guns. But what else could I do when they were threatening my life at every single meeting? I mean, seriously, I think most of the public sided with me on that. But then there were those little group that you were talking about, these trolls who pop up, mostly on Facebook because they're keyboard warriors, right? Right. But some of them will come out behind their keyboards and they will come to the microphone and they will make those threats and they will do those things. But what they really don't realize is that they're wasting tax dollars. OK, they think it's a show and they think it's funny and they think that they're doing something that's provocative and it's cool and it's going to get them somewhere on Facebook or wherever it is they're doing this. But you know what? They're wasting the, the tax dollars that could be going to classrooms. They're wasting the tax dollars that could be used on modernizing and correcting, you know, uh, school broken pavement and, and, and playground equipment that needs to be upgraded. They're wasting the police uh, resources, the city of Huntington Beach, because, you know, they're having to send cars out and patrol officers constantly because, you know what? HBPD was worried I was going to get hurt. Sure. You know, it's it, it's true. It was truly just. um I never seen anything like it in my life. I think I'm probably the most targeted or I've heard I'm the most targeted elected official in Orange County. I'm a, I think that's true. I, I know. But it, but the point of the ask yourself this question, Mike, why? I, I have asked myself that question and I haven't come up with an answer. Um, what I find intriguing is you know, I mentioned us going to meetings and. Mm -hmm. Who's the guy he has an I've seen his Facebook page and he has like an Indian last name, but he goes around with the cell phone and he and he's recording everybody with his cell phone and he gets in your face. Oh, that's and I, um, that's Nowy. Yeah, I saw him at the you had invited me to come introduce myself to the board. Yeah, I came out for that meeting and he was there at that meeting. And then I came to a second meeting. I don't even think you knew I was there. I came to a second meeting a couple months later. Uh -huh. He was there. Yeah. And I say to myself. What's his purpose in being here with his camera, recording everything like as though uh, it kind of came off like people who think the police are going to do something horrible, um, abuse people or whatever. So they have their cameras out to re to record whatever goes on. Mm -hmm. I see there's there's a homeless advocate that does that a lot. Oh, I know um, this, too. That's my but that's. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a more that's done in a more of a positive fashion. You know, this seems to be like almost like he's trying to catch something. It, it, it reminds me like people who want to catch something on video, mm -hmm. edit down the video so that it's taken out of context and then make you look bad. That's how I took it. I mean, I could be completely off base, but I don't understand why, like, okay, not to 
not to diminish what it is that you do, but, but let's face it, you're, you're on the school board. It's not like, it's not like you're passing laws or taxes or anything like that. You're, you're making policy for a school district. And while that's a very important job in the grand scheme of things, most of the community, unless they have kids in your district, they're not affected by what you say, do, or, or implement. So why the, why the uproar? And I don't know. It's just, it's very strange to me. And I don't know, Huntington beach politics in general, Mm -hmm. I was watching closely the uh, city council election and never have I seen city council elections where it was so heated. Oh yeah. It gets ugly. Doesn't it? It's just, it's crazy. Like, like we have, we, we had a guy here, interestingly in Cyprus running for city council in 2016. And something gave me a feeling about this guy and turns out he's, he was arrested for, he was at a mall in Riverside with his wife and he was dragging her through the mall by her hair (gasps) and security, security caught it on video and they called the police and had him arrested. Well, since then he's been charged with like 10 or 15 different felonies. He's, he's been found guilty in San Bernardino County. He's been found guilty in orange County. But, but the point is like, we don't usually get stuff like that. You know, weirdos running, running for office. We usually get like a dad or a mom who's concerned about what's going on in their city. And then they, you know, they run. I I don't understand. Like your, your school district is a small portion of like the bigger area there. I don't get why these people are so rabid about it and why you've become the poster child for their anger. That, that just, I, I don't grasp that. Well, you know, I do want to make um, one point that actually, I think it was one of my critics made at the microphone. They said, you know, you're the, you're the judge, jury, and the executioner, because on a school board, you actually are the legislative body. You're the judicial body and you're the executive branch at the same time. And actually I do pass taxes on people. And the one thing that I spearheaded was the Measure R bond. And that one, uh, I mean, the reality is it's a it's a tax on each of our Ocean View residents. And it's a an assess, special assessment that comes on your property taxes. And people's taxes went up because of what I asked people to vote for. Now, granted, the voters themselves do vote it in. It's not just solely a decision of the Board of Trustees. Um, we did vote to put it on the ballot, but then, you know, it becomes a referendum and the voters themselves get to weigh in on it. So they tax themselves, if you think about it. But I if the board doesn't bring it forward, it doesn't happen. So a board of trustees does make law. We make local law. Mm-hmm. And we what we do is we serve as sort of a j- judicial branch because we expel and we also make decisions on personnel. We fire, we hire, um, we do due process stuff. Um, and then as far as taxation, things like that, um, you know, we control the purse strings and we, we do have the ability to to go out to pass, you know, a bond or taxes or a parcel tax, for, uh, for instance. So a lot of people became upset with me, um, not just because of the trash dump, but because I was spearheading the Measure R bond. And Huntington Beach is pretty conservative and they don't like taxes. Uh, and what had happened is in 2012, a bond had failed. There is there was never a bond passed in Ocean View until I brought it forward. So people saw me again. The spotlight went on me. Uh Oh, it's her. It's she's doing it. It's her. But it's the whole board. It's not just me. I was the person. Yes, the face of it. But I had to be. I was the president of the board. When you're the president of the board, you're the face of the school district. Right now, John Briscoe is the president of the board and he's the face. He's in the newspaper all the time. He does interviews. This is what you do when you're the, uh, you know, the leader of a particular organization. But instead of seeing it like that, they saw it as I am. They called me a political climber. I'm just going to my next job. Well, guess what? I'm in my seventh year as a school board member. I haven't gone anywhere yet. People thought after two years I was going to run for the city council or for state assembly or or for supervisor. I've been asked to run for everything you can imagine. OK, and I haven't done it. I haven't done it yet. That doesn't mean I'm not ever going to run for something else. But right now I'm a, t- I'm a school teacher and I have two kids in the system. So I'm on the school board because, well, I love school district business. I love the kids. I love the teachers. I love the parents. I love being involved. And um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's just they needed somebody to to villainize, vilify. 
And because I'm with a big D after my name, and I'm one of the only ones in Huntington Beach. There's very few of us. Jill Hardy's a Democrat, right? Um, right. Kim Carr that just got elected to the city council is a Democrat. But they're not real vocal or out there or activists. I'm an activist. I'm a person who's involved in the party as well. And I don't mind getting my hands dirty. And I think that's what people dislike about me the most. Because I'll get out there and I'll do the work that most, I think, elected officials don't want to do. And I, th- I believe that's why I've been targeted. And that and primarily because I stepped up for undocumented people. Uh, <laughs> children whose parents, how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> undocumented parents of our students who are all citizens. But bottom line, we all know there's undocumented residents in Huntington Beach. And you know what? I don't care what country you're from, what color you are, what ethnicity, what religion, what political party you are. No human being deserves to be polluted nobody no you're right you're absolutely right i think like i said multiple times during this time um what what really um drew me into your message and made me pay more attention is the fact that you speak up um you're i'm very much that same way i i when i when i was deciding to run or not run it was i i actually announced two years before the election I had a team of people who were trying to advise me, you know, you need to not say that. Well, why would I not say that? It's what I believe. If I believe it, I'm saying it. Well, but then people won't vote for you. Well, that's okay. If they don't want to vote for me because they don't agree with my stance. Right. That's how this, that's how our system is supposed to work. You're not supposed to vote for me because you think I'm this nice fluffy guy that, you know, will do whatever you want. You're supposed to vote for me because I'm going to get the job done that you want done. And um, you know, I draw the line at being, you know, rude and obnoxious to people, right. but at the same time, you know, I'm going to speak my mind and say, and say what's on my mind. And so like when I started hearing some of the things that had gone on with you and I, I, I heard about your, your, um, restraining order case, I started doing some research and reading and we just, and then I started reading the articles that were written by that, um, Chuck Johnson guy. And he's I was, I was mortified by what I was right. reading. He's, he's deranged. And, and, you know, I think back to, you know, my wife and I recently, um, we run, we run a small podcast network and I recently found this podcast called Dirty John oh. and there's, and there's a TV show that was, it was eight part TV show that was done about it. And it's a guy from Newport beach who, um, weaseled his way into women's lives and, um, got into like marriages without, um, prenuptial agreements by letting them think that he was a doctor and he, he was a con man. But the problem was super dangerous guy. And he ultimately he ended up trying to murder the woman's youngest child. (gasps) And that girl managed to fight back, get the knife away from him. And then she stabbed him to death. (gasps) Um, And the one thing she was concerned about the whole time and the police kept saying, why are you concerned about this? Is he dead? And it came out. Yeah. Why is she concerned if he's dead? Because he's threatening her family. And that's what worries me about a situation like yours. And it's why right away in the beginning more people in the public eye and i'm not just going to say just elected officials but anybody in the public eye we all need to stick together yeah and we need to stand up for our rights because it isn't right that someone can write whatever they feel like about you and and not tell the truth and get away with it you know if he wants to if he wants to give his opinion on something you've said or done Mm -hmm. and say it in a really nasty way that's his prerogative but when he lies about you makes threats to you um, that's where I draw the line. And I think everyone should draw the line there. And, and it amazes me that there were people who were ridiculing you yeah. for filing that restraining order. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't even think restraining orders are worth the paper they're written on most times. Mm-hmm. But it's a step you have to take in order to protect yourself in the long run. And you have children. I do. Right. I mean, and then I saw somebody make a comment about, I guess you, you going through a divorce or you went through a divorce Mm -hmm. and someone made a comment about that. And I think to myself, why so low? Why do we have to hit so low below the belt? If, if you're like I said about the people advising me, if my stance is going to not get me elected, then it's not going to get me elected. And if it's going to get me elected, then it's going to get me elected. Well, the same thing. If, if, if you, if someone opposes you, Based off of facts, if their facts are correct, they're going to come out on top. There's no need to attack you personally. And as soon as they start attacking you personally, 
they lose because there's so many people like me out there that I read that and it just drives me more into your corner over and over and over again because it, it's it's wrong to treat people that way and it's even more wrong to treat people who you know I guarantee I know there's people out there that think you're an elected official so you must get rich off of what you do I don't get anything not, it's not true I don't <laughs> we get a $230 yeah, stipend uh, a month so that we can buy gas to drive to the different school sites we don't get paid it's not like the yeah. assembly it's not like even being yeah. a city council. It's a tiny, we're basically volunteers. We do it because we love yep. helping the children. And and you know what? Chuck Johnson is so inappropriate. During this time when I was going through this with him, he actually got uh, collared in Aliso Viejo by the police down there and got caught with um, apparently some kind of open container in his car and drugs. Oh, surprise. He was arraigned on drug charges during all of this. So you think this is his behavior wasn't a manifestation of his drug and alcohol problems. And it was like, oh, well, oh, Gina's a liar. No, go look it up. It's right on the court's docket, you know, website, OCSupremeCourt.com. Look it up. Chuck has problems. He even went as far as saying, are you ready for this? He claimed I was having an affair with somebody I wasn't having an affair with. Hello. Never done that in my life. He also claimed that I was moonlighting at a gentleman's club as a stripper. Okay. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. And he was talking about, you know, he called me a whore. He called, I mean, can you imagine this? And I have two young children in the school system. It's like, you're right. You know what? Is that still free speech? Yes, but it's defamatory. And he knows that it's not true. That's when it becomes a tort. That's when it becomes libelous mm -hmm. because you have you have questioned my chastity. You have said things that are not accurate about me and you're putting them out there into the public domain. And you are making as fact that I work at a gentleman's club or that I am, you know, loose or whatever it is, which is completely untrue. And at the time I was married, nothing was wrong. This is what this man was doing to me, doing to me. And then I don't know if you've ever seen this. He actually took images and he doctored images of me. And he put me into all of these strange scenarios. He put me into a scenario with Rodney King. He put me into a scenario with Martin Luther King Jr. He has me at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. He has me. And then he, he called it, he called it the teacher, no, the megalomaniac's guide to, the teacher's megalomaniac's guide to something. Anyway, he made it out that I'm a megalomaniac and that I, that I am so important that I, I've been at all these different events. Well, actually, he's the one that put me in all these events. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, people love to make like memes of me. There's all these little strange pictures and they put them places. And I thought, how obsessed, oh, wait, how bored do people have to be that my, I am the focus of your day and that you make memes of me? Well, I had, I had mentioned earlier about having a lady come out of the woodwork mm -hmm. and she she st sort of toned it down once she got the cease and desist. In fact, she took down some of her Facebook posts that she put up. And what she would do is she would write false things about me, but she'd say that it was her editorial opinion. Like, and she thought that that's what she's saying. I, never, I, I know that <laughs> oh, she knew, but I didn't know like the word, like what she was saying. She was saying things like, um, she claimed that I, first of all, I found this out when I ran for school board, that there's another person with, who spells their name exactly like I do in this general area, but they have a different middle initial. Oh. And they've had like, um, various charges against them. And I actually had to go to the Cyprus chief of police and have her at the, it was a female at the time, mm -hmm. clear me of all of this and prove and write me a letter saying he is not the person that has this record. Yeah. But anyway, she, she was spreading that kind of stuff around. And well, eventually with the cease and desist, she started taking us things down. She stopped talking about me, but what she would do to kind of show us that she wasn't afraid of us, well, she would write an email to my attorney and she would carbon copy me on the email Oh wow! so that I, so that she's, yeah, I'm going to make contact with you anyway. Well, ultimately back in October, I get this email to my attorney telling my attorney that I was, um, cyber stalking her. <gasps> I'm like, wow, this is, this is interesting. So it turns out that a friend of mine who was on my campaign team had made a comment in a Buena Park forum on Facebook and she thought it was me with a fake account. So I looked at him and I said, she's going to file a restraining order according to what she says. And I'm going to bring you to court and say, you see the fake account? Here he is <laughs> right here, this guy. 
And thankfully, we just, my attorney advised me just to ignore her and wait until she files, you know, restraining order. So we did. And she's gone away. I mean, it's been five months now and she hasn't come back out of the woodwork. Of course, now that I say that, she'll show back up again. Um, but, but I'm with you. Like, like, why are people allowed to get away with, we, we need to change our laws because people should not be allowed to say those kind of things and not have to prove them because, you know, saying that you work at a strip club and that you're having an affair and all that stuff there, I don't care how many people you talk to, there's going to be a certain percentage that are just going to believe that. And, and they have no evidence will change their mind. Yeah. And that's the crazy part about it. People have believed it. And some of my colleagues have said to me, you know, someone came to me and asked, is it true? Is she really doing that? And then I have to have people defending me. It's like, you know how awful that is? You know, um, I'm sorry, but I've lived a pretty, um, I think, ethical life. I'm a, I try to do right by people. I'm not a, a person that is going to to do any of those things that he accused me of doing. And to have somebody say that is just really awful. Not maybe not so much even for me. It's like not a pity party. Woe is me. It's for my kids. I have a seven year old and I have a fourteen year old. Okay, and you know what? Children talk. And you know what? My kid did hear about it at school. He goes to Mesa View Middle School. And you know what? Kids see stuff on the Internet. Uh, his yes, friends, you know, his his friends all know. That, I mean, most of the children, obviously, they know I'm an elected person or whatever they know. But they also know that I've been harassed. A lot of people do know that. And, you know, how embarrassing for my boys to have to shoulder that they're just little kids. And you know what? There's right and there's wrong. There's just right. And there's wrong. Is it right to lie about people? Basic, I don't care what philosophy, religious background, whatever it is, don't lie about people. Don't lie. You know, don't fabricate. Is it right? Is it wrong? It's wrong to do that to another human being. It's just flat out wrong. Okay. It doesn't matter if you are a school board member, if you are, you know, the president of the United States. It's wrong. Tell the truth. Do your reporting, get factual reporting, have your facts, have your data collected. Don't put out misinformation because it only hurts the whole system of the free press in our country. You know, and I want to make sure that our press continues to be free. I don't like what uh, Donald Trump is doing to the press. I don't like that he calls them the fake, the fake news and this and that. Oh, OK, wrong. I don't call anyone the fake news. But what I can do is when I do see that a reporter has said something a little off or whatever, I contact them. I said, you know, you have this fact wrong. You know what? Nine times out of 10, they will correct it. OK. Yeah. But they're not going to do that with Donald Trump. Want to know why? Because he's dishonest. You see, and I feel, though, that it's like. At all these different levels, there's different levels, but when you're a school board member, you are in the same level as the president or as an assembly person, a senator, a congressman. We're all in the same group of that we can literally almost like be libeled, like it's okay because of that New York um, Times case. Do you have you heard yeah, of that? Yeah. That whole case, that's what did it. Well, you know, you know, remember when the whole thing about Elizabeth Warren and her nationality yeah. came out? Yeah. Well, the Boston Globe did an article about it, and um, their initial information was was incorrect. Okay. So um, they corrected it okay. more than once. And so we were at Politicon, covering Politicon, mm -hmm. and um, the reporter was on a panel, and she defended herself, and I felt really bad for her because she was probably <laughs> the only one on her side. And later we, my wife and I are sitting at like a, a couch in the convention center and she sits down there and I started talking to her. That's just me. I'm like, I'll talk to anybody. Yeah. And, and I said something to her about, Oh, poor, you know, what's this fake news stuff. And she goes, can you imagine that they're going to call it fake news? But I corrected the story three times. If, if I wanted it to be fake news, I wouldn't have corrected the story at all. And they don't want to address that. I corrected the story, right? They, 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 they want to just continue to say, oh, you made a mistake, therefore it's fake news. She said, no, fake news is I know damn well that um, Donald Trump was out with his wife last night, but instead I say he was out with a stripper. That's fake news. And she said, and this is what makes me angry, is that people don't seem to understand the difference between making a mistake when you report something versus purposely mm -hmm. reporting false news. And she said, and none of us want to do that. We don't, she said, I'm not the publisher of the Boston Globe. 
I have a boss. So if I purposely report facts that aren't facts, I'm getting fired and I need my job. So I'm not going to do that ever. Right. And <clears throat> we we discuss, we had a little discussion about how um, your political party preference kind of plays into it. And honestly, like as a libertarian, when I started, when, when Trump got elected, I took a neutral stance. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give him, I'm going to give him a pass for now and see what happens. Right. And I'm, I'm at the point now where, you know, the evidence is too overwhelming. Um, but at the same time, I'm not sure how much of it is really true. So I'm kind of waiting for that report to come from the independent, you know, council to see, and then I'll make up my permanent mind. Right. But for now, <clears throat> for now, I kind of feel like, yeah, that he was doing some dirty dealings and um, maybe not necessarily just with his campaign either. Um, but too many people there, they state things that have been disproven and you say something about it online. And if it's in favor of Trump, oh, suddenly you're a Trump supporter. And I laugh because you obviously don't know me. If you think, if you think I support that guy, I know you, I said, don't. I know you don't. I read enough of what you write. And know you don't. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, I, you just I go pretty much what you write out there. I see it. <laughs> it's like, come on now. Why would I, why would I? So then I, then I came up with a method. Like well, if I mentioned something about him, I say, Hey, they already proved that that's not true about orange and I'd make some nickname for him. Then they then suddenly because you use like a bad name for him. Oh, okay. He doesn't support him. And I, I'm like, what's this lunacy that we have to be slightly disrespectful to our president in order to get people to understand that I'm not on his side. Um, why can't you take me at my word when I say I'm not on his side? And I guess it's because they don't want to believe that they want to believe what they believe. I and you're, and you're falling into that. Because you got people that are hearing these things about you and then they're repeating them, yeah. even though you personally have denied it. Yes. I'm one of those people that if you personally deny something, unless I see other evidence, I believe you. That's it. Because there's like, OK, if you were having an affair, there's basically two people who know for sure the person you're having an affair with and you. Right. Well, if you say no, then it's a no. I'm, I'm going with the no unless there's real proof otherwise and why wouldn't i i mean i think that's only fair where one of the problems with our society today is that we're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty but instead as soon as they make the accusation about anything we're guilty and i have a pr big problem with that mm -hmm. i have a big problem with that so la last thing i'm going to say and, and i think we should wrap up is um you know i appreciate you first of all coming on but i also appreciate you as a person you know standing up for what you believe and um, fighting for the rights of kids. Uh, not enough people do that. Um, even, you know, you think people get elected to school boards because they care about children. Um, but a lot of them use it as a stepping ladder mm -hmm. to higher office right away. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you get the bug and you want to move up. But when the plan is to spend two years on the school board of a four year term and move on, eh, I think that's kind of wonky. Yeah. Um, so, but thanks for everything you do for the kids. I, I really appreciate that. And I mean, I've enjoyed, um, getting to know you a little bit better from afar. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe someday we can have lunch together and, and, you know, Good. actually get to know each other and have a connection. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, you, you're inspiring because you don't back down from these people. And yet I know it doesn't mean you're not afraid of, you know, some lunatic coming out of the woodwork, but you're not going to stop doing what's right just because there's crazy people trying to silence you. And I, I, for one, you know, applaud you for that. And I will always be in your corner on stuff like that because you. you're, you're, you're just honest. And um, to me, that's the most important thing is honesty. I don't like when people lie about things. Like I always say, if you have to lie your, your viewpoint, you need to rethink your viewpoint because there's something wrong with even, you know, there's something wrong with it or you wouldn't lie. Right. Um, like I mentioned to you in the green room, you know, the homeless shelter issue, right. we have people making arguments against it that already happened. They're already there. So why, why, how does the shelter that isn't there yet causing this problem that already exists? Right. How about you just be realistic and say, I don't want it in my backyard. We'd be okay with that. Is that like a straw man argument? What's that one called? From yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Crazy. Exactly. The straw man argument. Uh, they set it up and knock it down, you know, and um, what they don't, and then I get a bad reputation because I call them out on it. Hey, and and what I do now, I say, well, hold on. Like one of the things they complain about is there's a school about a half a mile away, right? And I say, but wait a second, aren't there already a, 
isn't there already a tent encampment a half a mile away from the school? Yes. Yeah. So then how is that going to draw? How is it that the shelter is going to draw homeless encampment half a mile away from the school when there's already a homeless encampment half a mile? Well, but you know what I mean? No, that's, but what you said was the shelter is going to cause that. Be honest and say, you don't think this is the solution. No one's going to argue with you if that's your opinion. But if you lie to support your opinion, now we don't listen to you anymore. That's right. And we had people, we went to a city council meeting. We had the lady, this lady and her husband in front of us. They didn't listen to a thing anyone said and then went online and badmouthed the entire plan. And I said, well, how do you know you weren't paying attention? How do you know I wasn't paying attention? I sat two rows behind you. That's how I know you weren't paying attention. You're like, I'm um, FBI. <laughs> exactly. I have a camera on you at all times. It's I'm following you everywhere. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I, if you want to let people know how they can get in touch with you, ask you questions. I mean, they're going to enjoy this. We, we went a long time too, which is great. Yeah. So yeah, you can get in touch with me um, by going to my website, which is Gina Clayton Tarvin and no hyphen, just all one thing. Dot com. My email is Gina Clayton Tarvin at gmail.com. And you know what? I even let people call me. If you wanted to call me, you can call me. Um, I have a, a published phone number. It's 714-717-7122. I literally take calls from constituents. I don't uh, shy away from anyone. You can call with a complaint. You can call with a uh, anything you want to talk about. Um, and I will listen to you. And you can be from anywhere in California, the United States, outside. It doesn't matter. I, I literally, if I can help you, I'm happy to do so. And, um, you know, our board meetings are on Tuesday nights uh, every first and third Tuesday at the Ocean View School District headquarters in Huntington Beach, just off of uh, Warner Avenue. And we would love to see anyone there and come to public comments and talk about what you want to talk about. And um, yeah, I'm just really happy to be able to serve the public. And I'm really pleased that you allowed me to be on your show today. And thank you for your support. And just know that I'm in your corner too. Awesome. I appreciate it. And anytime you want to come on, you just let me know because I'm sure there's lots of things we could talk about. I think we really did scratch the surface. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So anyway, anyway, this has been another episode of Liberty Revealed. And if you uh, want to know what personal liberty is about, I have a little giveaway that I have at at yogispodcastnetwork.com forward slash Liberty Revealed. You just stick your email address in there and they'll send you a PDF with um, some descriptive issues that have to do with liberty and um not your typical things that you might think so give it give it a try and uh once again thanks gina for being on and uh and uh this has been another episode of liberty revealed great thanks for listening to liberty revealed the show where you learn about all things liberty please visit the show's website at yogispodcastnetwork.com backslash lr where you can reach out to mike directly with your questions and comments again that is yogispodcastnetwork.com backslash LR.